Hi, I'm Ned, and I make games. Today I have an interesting Unity tutorial for you. How to build and save a mesh asset using a compute shader. Compute shaders are special programs that run on the GPU, and are specialized for problems that can be broken up into several smaller parts. If this describes your mesh, a compute shader is perfect to construct it very quickly. In the process, we'll learn how to set up and dispatch a compute shader from the editor, get back data from the GPU, and create and save a mesh asset. I have an introduction to compute shaders video that you may want to watch. I'll explain the basics of compute shaders in this video, but it may be helpful to see it from another angle. You should also know how a mesh is described using a vertex and index array, as well as simple HLSL code syntax. Before we get started, I want to thank you all for watching. If you're new, I create weekly game development tutorials, so please consider subscribing and turning on bell notifications. Also, check out our community Discord server. It's great for development help. There's a link in the video description. With that, let's get started. I used Unity 2020.2.2F1 and Universal Render Pipeline 10.2.2 in this project. However, the code I'll write should work when using any renderer. If you're using a newer version of Unity, check the video description for any fixes. Like my previous video, we'll use a compute shader to build little pyramids on each triangle of a mesh. It's not a super useful effect, but we can learn a lot from it. First, set up your project to use the Universal Render Pipeline, or any other renderer. Now, we'll be working with editor scripts. To tell Unity that these scripts should not be included in game builds, create a folder called Editor. Any code inside is now editor only. Create a c -sharp script called Pyramid Bake Settings. We'll use this to define an asset which will hold generation settings. Open it. First, have the class inherit from scriptable object instead of mono behavior. If you've never worked with these before, the scriptable object class allows us to set up our own custom asset types. Add the Create Asset Menu Attribute. This makes it easy to create a new asset of this type through Unity's Create drop-down menu. The file name argument defines the default file name for our new asset, and the menu name defines where this option will appear in the Unity menu. You can even define submenus using forward slashes. Before returning to Unity, add several public properties, including a source mesh and source sub mesh index to define the mesh that we'll build on top of, a scale and rotation to apply to the mesh before adding pyramids, as well as a pyramid height. Back in Unity, create a new pyramid bake settings asset using the new menu entry. Okay, that's great. But now we need a script to read this data and build a mesh. Let's create a custom inspector so we can add a button to do just that. In your editor folder, create a new c -sharp script called Pyramid Bake Inspector. This class should inherit from editor, signaling it as a custom inspector for some class. Tell Unity that this should be the inspector for Pyramid Bake settings by using this custom inspector attribute. Now, override the onInspectorGUI method and call the base method. This draws the default inspector, so we can still edit asset properties. Now, to add a button, call GUILayout.Button, passing a label string. The function returns true if it was pressed this update. Add a debug log and then return to Unity. Select your asset and there's the button. Pressing it will print out our debug message. To forge onward, I think it's easiest to write the compute shader next. That way we can clearly see what it needs to run. Create a compute shader called Pyramid Builder and open it. Like graphic shaders, compute shaders are written in HLSL. This hash pragma kernel line defines a function that we can call from C sharp. Let's name ours main, then define it like this. The num threads attribute tells the compiler how many independent threads to spawn at once. You can define this in three dimensions, which is useful when working with textures, but we're fine with just using the X dimension. The numbers here can take some fine tuning to find the best size, but let's start with 128. Calling this kernel from the CPU is called dispatching. When you dispatch, you tell the GPU how many thread groups to create. For instance, if you dispatch 10 groups, main will run 120 times times 10, or 1280 times. 
an argument to main, marked with the SV underscore dispatch thread ID semantic, holds a unique ID among all calls of this function, a fact that we can use to work on a unique triangle on each call. Let's back up a little and define a few data structures. We'll be using data buffers, or chunks of memory access like arrays, to read input data and write output data. The CPU can also upload data to these buffers. Since we're working with meshes, we'll want a vertex buffer and an index buffer, where every three entries in the index buffer holds vertex IDs which, together, form a triangle. We'll output a mesh in the same fashion, but notice that these buffers are prefixed with RW, meaning that we can also write to them. Now, define the vertex data structures. Input vertices will have a position and UV, while output vertices will also contain a normal. Finally, we'll set a few other variables on the compute shader, the number of triangles in the source mesh, the pyramid height, and a transformation matrix. Return to the main function. We want this to run once per triangle in the source mesh, so if the dispatch ID is larger than the number of triangles, return. Now, get the points of our work triangle. Calculate the start index into the index buffer by multiplying the dispatch ID by 3. Grab the three corner vertices out of the buffers, and then feed them into this transform function. What does transform do? We can write it above. It applies the transform property to the vertex position, allowing us to scale and rotate the source mesh before building off of it. Now that we have the triangle corners, let's calculate the pyramid point. First, compute the normal vector of a plane containing this triangle. I'll encapsulate it in this function. We can find it by taking the cross product of two lines formed by the triangle corners. We can find the center point of a triangle by averaging the corner points. Then, extrude along the normal vector by the pyramid height, and we have the pyramid top vertex. Also, compute the center UV by averaging the corner UVs. It's time to output and write the new triangles to the output buffers. Since each execution of the function outputs three triangles, each with three vertices and three indices. We can find the start position in the output buffers by multiplying the dispatch ID by 9. Soon, we'll create an add triangle function. Pass it a start index and the three corner points for triangles 1, 2, and 3. Let's write the add triangle function. Calculate the normal for the new triangle. Then, call make generated vertex for each triangle point, also passing the triangle normal and store each result in the generated vertices buffer. Write this make generated vertex function to copy the position and UV from a source vertex into a generated vertex, as well as set the triangle normal. Back in add triangle, we also need to store these indices into the index buffer. And with that, our triangle is stored. In fact, we're done with the entire shader, so save it and return to Unity. Okay, there's one more missing link here. Let's create a script to tie everything together. It will take in the settings asset, set up the buffers, dispatch the compute shader, and return the generated mesh. In the editor folder, create a C-sharp script called Pyramid Baker and open it. Mark the class as static, since we don't need to create instances of it, and remove the mono behavior inheritance. Since this class will fill the buffers in the compute shader, we need C-sharp of each vertex structure. Make sure the variables inside the structures are in the same order as they are in the compute shader. For example, make sure that position appears before UV. For extra safety, this attribute tells the compiler to lay out the structure fields in memory in a fashion that works well with the compute buffers. Now, when working with GPU buffers, we have to calculate something called a stride, which is the byte size of one element in the buffer. For index buffers, the stride is simply the size of one integer. The vertex buffers are made of floats though, and you need to count up how many are in each structure. It's not really too difficult. There's three floats in a vector three. So there's five floats in the source vertex and eight in a generated vertex. Next, we'll need a function to decompose a mesh object into vertex and index buffers. I wrote this function to do that. It looks complicated, but it really just extracts a submesh's vertices and triangles from the mesh object, translating vertex data into our source vertex structure. Similarly, this function creates a mesh object from our generated vertex and index buffers. Now, make a static function called run, which takes in a compute shader and a pyramid settings asset. 
It returns a boolean to signal if the process completed successfully, and the generated mesh as an out argument. Inside, decompose the mesh. Using these arrays, we know how many indices are in the mesh, so we can calculate how many triangles. Next, instantiate the output buffers as arrays. Remember that the compute shader generates 9 vertices and indices per source triangle. Next, create several graphics buffer objects. These link to the GPU buffers and don't actually hold data onto the CPU. The target enumeration specifies which type of buffer to use. We want structured buffers, since they work like arrays. Be sure to pass the correct length and stride for each buffer. If you watched my previous video on compute shaders, you may wonder why these are graphics buffers and not compute buffers. In short, graphics buffers are generic versions of compute buffers that can encapsulate any GPU buffer. It's best to use them if possible, so I will. Now, we need to get the ID of our main kernel on the compute shader. Using this ID, we can set the buffers on the shader. Keep in mind, this sets the memory location of each buffer and not the data inside, which we haven't even uploaded yet. Take this time to also set the transform, pyramid height, and number of source triangle variables. To upload data to the buffers on the GPU, Call set data on the graphics buffer objects. Now the shader is ready to access our source mesh data, and we're also ready to dispatch it. Get the thread size from the kernel function and make sure that we dispatch enough groups to cover each source triangle. Then call dispatch. At this point, the CPU will continue running. The GPU will not execute our shader immediately. However, Unity is smart enough so that if we call another function that needs data from the compute shader, it will wait for the shader to finish. Speaking of which, call get data on the buffers to download their contents into our arrays. One small note here, it's never a good idea to call get data during runtime since it's extremely slow. It's all right in the editor and there are ways to get around this, which I plan to explore in future videos. But back to the present, call compose mesh to turn the generated buffers into a mesh object. Finally, release the buffers, freeing up their reserved memory on the GPU. Return true since we encountered no errors. Okay, we're almost done. Open up the inspector file. We need to call pyramidbaker.run, however it needs a compute shader object. Since we're running in the editor, we can have it search the asset database and automatically grab the shader. This function returns the asset ID of an asset called pyramid builder. We can use GUID to asset path and load asset at path to get the actual shader object. Now the compute shader can take a little bit to run, so call display progress bar so the user knows it's working. Get the settings object this inspector is editing using serialized object dot target object, and then call pyramid baker dot run, passing in the needed data. At this point, we have the generated mesh, so we can clear the progress bar, hiding it. If our Baker class finished successfully, we should save the mesh as an asset. Call this save mesh method. Before writing that though, add a couple of useful debug messages. In save mesh, let the user specify a location to save this asset using save file panel. If it returns null or an empty string, the player canceled, so we should just exit as well. This get project relative path transforms a file path into a format Unity likes working with. Now, if we just save the asset there, it could overwrite an existing mesh. We don't want that, since it could break any references to it in other scenes, forcing us to fix them every time we need to update the mesh. Instead, check if there's already a mesh at the chosen file path. If there is, we should copy the data of the new mesh into the old mesh. First, clear the old mesh, readying it to receive new data and then call copy serialized. In an else block, if there's no mesh at the file path, call create asset and save the new mesh there. Finally, call save assets to finalize all asset changes. At long last, we're done. Return to the Unity editor and test things out. Create a game object with a mesh renderer and mesh filter component and give it a material. Set everything on your pyramid baker settings object Press the Create button and wait for it to finish. Save the generated mesh, and then set that mesh in the Mesh Filter component in your scene.
As I said, this effect isn't super practical, but it can create some interesting things to look at. And hopefully you learned a lot about working in the editor and about compute shaders. This video is long enough, so I won't ramble on, but being able to generate meshes in the editor is pretty useful. For instance, I'll use this system to generate grass meshes. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss videos about that. Also, I want to take a second to plug my Patreon. Of course, if you can't contribute, please don't feel bad. You watching these tutorials is more than enough. But if you can, I have several goodies for you, including early access to videos, polls about tutorial topics, and downloadable project files. Thank you all so much for your support. It also helps me a lot if you could like this video, since it causes YouTube to recommend it more to others. And please don't hesitate to leave a comment if you need some clarification about anything. I do read them all. How would you like to use compute shaders? Is there another topic you'd like to see a video about? Thanks again for watching, and make games.